Today's show is sponsored by Janice Henderson Investors. In an environment where allocators face more questions than answers, having a trusted partner is critical. Janice Henderson Investors is committed to building partnerships with institutional investors based on collaboration, insights, and transparency. With 26 offices and 350 investment professionals worldwide, Janice Henderson has the scale to offer global perspective across equities, fixed income, and alternatives, and the depth to offer local expertise and support for clients. To learn more about partnering with Janice Henderson, visit JaniceHenderson.com slash institutional. Today's show is also brought to you by iConnections iConnections software platform seamlessly connects managers and allocators for virtual meetings, giving managers the ability to subscribe and share information with allocators who can efficiently select and meet managers all on one platform. The scalable technology powering iConnections can be used for bespoke events by managers, allocators, and service providers. Visit iConnections.io to learn more. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocators.com. My guest on today's show is Katie Hall, the founder and co-chair of Hall Capital Partners, a $40 billion OCIO for high net worth families, endowments, and foundations. Katie launched Hall Capital with the backing of Don Fisher, Warren Hellman, and recent presidential candidate Tom Steyer back in 1994, and has grown that base to serve over 130 clients today. Our conversation covers Katie's background, her path to starting Hall Capital, and her approach to the business. We then turn to her investment philosophy, customized asset allocation, and thoughts on alternatives, crypto, and ESG. We close with Katie's perspectives on governance and the future of Hall Capital. Before we get going, I wanted to let you know that we're enrolling the first cohort of Capital Allocators University, a live online course that starts on September 21st. Rahul Mudgal and I put together a course to help train investment professionals on the skills they need to succeed at the most senior levels of their organizations, but that aren't typically taught in investment curriculum. We'll be joined by an all-star cast of past guests on the show to help you learn foundational skills like time management and public speaking, and value-added ones like decision-making and networking. Hop on the website and click University in the menu to learn more. Please enjoy my conversation with Katie Hall. Katie, great to see you. Great to be here. Well, I'd love to start with going back to when you founded Hall Capital. And you can talk a little bit about your background and what the thinking was at the time. Sure. Well, the founding of Hall Capital was actually after the first chapter of my investing career. And in fact, the founding is really kind of related to that first chapter. So after I got out of grad school, I went back to Morgan Stanley, where I worked at the Risk Arb Desk. After a couple of years, I left to join my good friend, Tom Steyer, who had just founded a risk arbitrage operation called HFS Partners. It stood for Hellman, Friedman, and Steyer. So he started in January and he convinced me to join him in August. And so we... It was a rock and rolling time risk arbitrage, and we were partners for three years. And then I got to be in my bond to set up my own shop. And so in October of 1989, I started trading a new partnership called Laurel Arbitrage Partners that was really a joint venture with Montgomery Securities. And I was there all excited to set up this new entity, and you could not have picked a worse time to set up a risk arbitrage (laughs) partnership than October of 1989. One, there was a big earthquake in California, so that was sort of epic. And shortly after that, there was a big earthquake in Arbland, which was the failure of the United Airlines buyout. And 
we got through that fine from an investing partnership, but it basically almost stopped merger activity on a dime after that because financing for mergers literally went away. So I had this small risk arbitrage partnership. Really, there was not much going on. And so I really toiled away in the next really five years trying to like focused on risk arbitrage, but which is merger activity where there's not much merger activity to do, really wasn't you know, a chance to sort of scale the partnership. And so I worked away. I figured out you know, periodically really reassessing what to do. And it was in early 1994 that I was talking with Warren Hellman, who was the largest investor in my little R partnership at that time, about what to do next. And he suggested that I start working with his family about their broader investment issues. I was working on an ad hoc basis with one other family. My business plan literally was basically, why not? <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up liquidating my risk R partnership and rolling the general partner, which is me, into really the firm that we've become today. And I was really ready at that point in time to do something different. I mean, arbitrage is super interesting, but it's a reactive business and it's a narrow business. And I was intensely reminded that it's also a cyclical business. And I was just ready to think bigger. I was ready to think about a broader array of investment issues, just think bigger. And that's really what I was able to do with these first two families. Actually, pretty quickly, there was two other families that were looking for someone to help them think about overall deployment of a pool of assets. So I worked with these four families for this first year, the summer of 1994 through middle of 1995, really trying to figure out what was the business, how to think about the business, how to think about investing in a multi-asset class way. And then by June of 95, I actually did write out a little business plan and capitalize the company and really have grown from there. So that's a long time ago. And certainly a lot's happened to go from four families to whatever it is, 40 billion in assets. I'd love to know both how you thought about what the business and the business model would be, and then we'll get to the investment side of it as well. The business model was really one that I was pretty clear about really from the beginning and has more or less stayed consistent throughout, which is rooted in independence and objectivity and basically only being paid one way, which was by our clients. And it's priced in basis points in a way that is meant to be long-term alignment of interests. And that is actually, I think, a really important founding principle that we've stayed true to. Again, it was true then, it's still true now, is that the business has been filled with lots of conflicts. People address them and note them, but those conflicts just create different behaviors. And so trying to set up to minimize, if not eliminate that vis-a-vis -vis our clients, who we really want to be in partnership with, that was sort of the core business principle. And so as you start there with four families, give me a quick progression of how that all went from four to 130 over many years now. Today, it's not just families. Well, we started with families, but families, you know, we work with families, foundations, endowments. The business is so interesting. Back in the day, it was completely a referral business. It was our clients. They would actually refer to another family and we might have a couple of meetings, but people would make a decision based on what they understood was available, kind of reputation. Really, a lot of the vetting came from their peers. And that's very much how it grew. I mean, I always said that we were essentially a business that was absolutely bought, not sold, because I don't believe you can convince somebody about the merits of a diversified portfolio if they don't want a diversified portfolio. And so we really grew that way for really much of our history. I'd say that there were a couple of important turning points that how the business has evolved. I'd say a really important turning point for all of us that are working in the outsourced chief investment officer role, although that isn't the vocabulary we used to use, but that's the function we performed throughout, was the Madoff. Because the way that Madoff got most of his clients was by referrals from his current clients. 
it was not, again, them selling people and convincing people. It was existing clients saying, the numbers are incredible, invest with this guy. And so that definitely changed wealthy families' willingness to just go on the referral of somebody else that they know that they consider smart or a good investor. So we definitely saw through that time the much more institutionalization of the whole process where not just institutions would have RFPs or requests for proposals, but family, it's very common for families to go through a much more organized process of evaluating different possible service providers, if you will. And how did you build out your team over the years to support the growing business? At the beginning, I was fortunate to add some really great people to help just on the technical piece of the business. Joanne Hagopian was out of an accounting firm, and she grew to become a very valued partner before leaving actually to run a family office for one of our clients. And it was really that grow your partner. I was able to convince John Boymaster, who is co-chairman with me of the firm today, where John had had, actually he had had a career as a partner, trusted estates partner at a law firm. He was at the time at J.P. Morgan working in the private bank. And that's been our view all along is like, let's absolutely go for the A plus people and bring them in and bring them in as partners. And to have the folks that have been part of the firm really have that commitment to doing the best for our clients, that deep investment experience and capability. And I was very much willing to bring in that quality and, if you will, share the wealth that comes with actually bringing in people as partners, not as employees. Then we've also had the benefit of really being able to grow talent from within. Two of the three managing partners literally began their career. So we really do have a real commitment to continuing to develop the talent that we have in the company. And it's served us very well. So I know in your organization, and certainly a lot of the organizations that you invest with, we hear a lot about broad ownership, incentives, and alignment. And I know we've talked about how much you've implemented on that. And I was wondering if you could share your thinking about what that ownership culture means. It does relate to really being willing to give up a meaningful portion of ownership. And today, out of our, I don't know, give or take 190 employees, 38 are owners in the firm. So we really have worked to continue to have that build on that sense of partnership and continue to expand that ownership. And we've also done it through a generational transfer that I really do believe that better to own a smaller part of a big, big pie than a lot of a smaller pie. And I think that we've been able to grow our pie, if you will, substantially because everybody is sort of working together and the senior leadership has meaningful stake and meaningful ownership in that. And we have, over the years, worked to further that transition of ownership through essentially borrowing and repurchasing parts of my stake, parts of John's stake, parts of our outside owner's stake, and then reallocating that to the senior people and throughout the firm. How have you seen that shared ownership play out in the motivations of the people on your team? I think it has played out in the sense that there really is, again, the sense of one team. And that is something that we have tried to set up really throughout the way that we incentivize and comp people. We don't pay people for client acquisition because we view that as something that the entire firm is responsible for in terms of we have each of our senior people that are leading client teams views that client team as their responsibility and their whole team's working for that. But we are all collectively doing what we can to support that and to make it work. So I think it's really trying to reinforce this idea that we all are going to benefit from actually doing very well by our clients in every way possible, starting with investment performance, but then very much being their aligned problem-solving partner in other ways. I'm curious what you've learned from running this business about what really works and what doesn't. Oh my God. There's so many things that mistakes, scars, good news, bad news over the time that I've been doing this. 
I would say that I deeply believe and I think has been reinforced that a long-term investing perspective is the right one and it's the winning strategy. I also have been reminded periodically that that is a really hard thing to do and that even people that have said, absolutely, we have a long-term perspective, we're committed to that, we believe in it. When they come times to those uncomfortable discontinuities between short-term performance and index performance, and you say, well, don't I really want to adopt a more short-term relativist strategy? <laughs> you know, and we've been sort of absolutely consistent in saying the right one is the long one. Let's stay focused on the long one. But that, I'd say I've learned that that is the right answer, but it is a really hard path often. So between those conversations with your clients, and maybe later we'll talk about some of the investment committees you've sat on, have you found any particular methodologies that when you're in that moment help in terms of the conversation you have with the person across the table to reframe them into that long-term time horizon? I think that it is actually continuing to re-examine the data and to, to actually help get into more nuanced layers of attribution so that in shorter terms, people can understand if what might be leading to something that feels distorted. Interesting, that's one of the things that I have found having particularly talking about equities, when we have used active management quite extensively, and active in our vocabulary typically is very concentrated managers, having the ability to actually talk about specific companies as really good real life examples of why there might be valuation differences or performance differentials can help build that understanding beyond just sort of the aggregated numbers. Well, along the way here, you've mentioned a long-term time horizon, you've mentioned active management, some concentration. Let's dive into the investment side and maybe start with how you approach, it could be a new client, and describe what it is from a philosophical perspective that you're trying to deliver for all your clients. Well, there's a couple of things. One, we have, again, this goes back, harks back to the beginning. We don't think that there is a right asset allocation. We don't have a model portfolio. We don't have any of those. We really believe that the right allocation, the right roadmap for any particular client, whether it be a foundation or a family, is a function of what we're specifically trying to accomplish with that pool of capital under those circumstances. So the first thing that we do in any client relationship is to actually really dig in, to dig into a deep understanding of what are the goals, the objectives, the explicit constraints, the implicit constraints, to really try and develop a much more kind of nuanced way of understanding of what are all of the elements and objectives and constraints that would inform what ultimately becomes an asset allocation. And once that is, if you will, agreed upon, that actually is the roadmap. We use them as roadmaps, not as point targets. It's really much more of a range mindset. But again, we have a direction. We do believe in diversification across asset classes. Long-term diversified portfolio is the winning hand in most cases. And we believe within asset classes that it makes sense to have as much concentration as is tolerable, that you're really getting the diversification across the asset classes primarily, as well as with inside. And so then across different asset classes, what are your biases in terms of effectively what the opportunity set should be for any one of your clients? Well, we use large buckets of asset classes. So we talk about core cash and fixed income. We talk about equities. We talk about alternative assets slash head funds. We talk about private equity, private investments. We encompass this private equity, venture, growth capital. We talk about hard assets. So you start with big buckets as opposed to narrowly defined. And so I think that that in some sense answers the question. We're trying to get over away from trying to tilt towards any one narrow return pattern or targeted return pattern. 
I'd say that that is a place where there's differences. There's differences based on individual individual circumstances, but there's also that is a place where there's individual there's differences based on tax status. It is very common for us to have a higher percentage of some alternative assets in tax exempt institutions as opposed to taxpayers. I mean, for the obvious reasons, but our portfolios are generally or heavily oriented towards overall capital appreciation, and we're getting that disproportionately through equities and private equity slash venture. I'm curious that even though you don't have a model portfolio, if you were to think about your clients in terms of their composition, right? So a a tax exempt looks a lot different from a taxable, maybe a certain type of taxable investor looks different from another one. How wide is the variety of where you end up in terms of allocating to those different buckets? Actually, surprisingly varied. The places where there's meaningful difference, and probably this is more true in the family world, is in what's needed in core cash and fixed income. That tends to be a dollar amount as opposed to a percent. But there's a huge range of what people need to have that sort of sense of flexibility, stability, mindset that permits the rest of the portfolio to run on a long-term basis. The other place where there's meaningful differences is in just the percent in long-term illiquid. But if you're adding real assets and private investments, to a certain extent, private credit, which we refer to as hybrid, just that aggregate long-term illiquidity is another constraint that that's the other place where there's the biggest difference. So when it comes to the process of manager selection, filling these buckets, I'd love to start with how's your team set up on the investment side? So we are set up, everybody has their groups, but we just have equities and they're responsible for looking at all the long strategies as well as long short strategies. Those that are really public equity stock picking is sort of the underpinning of that investment discipline. We have real assets. We have, we call it our absolute return group. Absolute return is responsible for long credit and the spread based types of strategies that live in hedge fund land. And then we have a privates team. So let's dive into each one of those for fun. Let's start with equities. You mentioned concentration. What does that mean to you? There's not any one answer, but in general, we think if you're going to be investing in a way that is an active manager, you need to be different than an index. So you don't end up with just an expensive index. And the way that you most frequently get there is by being significantly more concentrated. We invest with managers that on the very limit side, we have invested with managers that own a dozen positions. We also have invested with managers that own 60 plus. I think it's very rare that we've invested with managers that have north of 100, unless it's sort of more like farm team and stuff. Just to, Those aren't like rules. It's just about the idea. If you're going to actually vary from the index, you have to vary from the index. What does the process look like distinguishing between, let's say your subset is there's more concentrated managers? How does your team go about finding them and then distinguishing one from the next? Our approach across all investments, it's the same. And we have that reflecting our overall investment philosophy. So we start from the viewpoint that we don't have to do anything. And so it's really a matter of One, thinking about an investment opportunity set. What is an opportunity set that's delivered or out there? Then we're thinking about, is it something that we think is available and will generate attractive returns on a going forward three, five, ten-year basis? We're then looking at identifying people, the players. Who are the people that actually can or are taking advantage of that opportunity set and doing it well. What's the evidence of success that they can do it well? Your past performance, their investment methodology. It's really digging in and saying, okay, we think there's the opportunity. What leads us to believe that this group of people knows how to do that and actually capture that opportunity? So, I mean, there's obvious they kind of understand the investment discipline, the investment practice, the history, but then it's also really about understanding the organization. We talk about incentives. We're really interested in what makes an organization tick. How are people be rewarded? Because that tells us a lot about 
where people allocate their time, where people allocate their energy, what their commitment is, how they're going to follow through, which is all fed back into the evaluation of, which is ultimately a judgment, right? Which is the probability of that particular team being successful. And going back to your question about how do we find people, whether it be in a concentrated equity strategy or anything else, we find them every way possible. We cast a big net every place that we can. We're always interested in learning. We also, at this point, we're pretty well known. So we are on the receiving end of a lot of things. Just last year alone, we got material from over a thousand different firms slash funds on an incoming basis. That's new stuff. That's not just a sort of thing. So we're on the receiving end of a lot. And as people leave other firms and start new firms, again, we are in that crossroads and have the opportunity to evaluate a lot of them. So we are a very much large aperture (laughs) approach to (laughs) identifying and meeting people. That'd be fun to take that plan that you laid out and apply it to alternatives where you started your career in risk garb, which for some point in time was like the ultimate absolute return on correlated investment, much less so today. So if you think about just that hedge fund landscape, what do you see looking out as what that opportunity set is? It is actually a very complicated and interesting question, in part because a lot of the spread-based return opportunities, those spreads have just compressed. And so even where there's sort of interesting things to do, it's harder to actually realize attractive whole dollar returns. So I think that we have seen that migrate to more complex credit strategies. We've seen that move to some more leveraged credit strategies. We do see interesting things, you know, that comes and goes in merger arb land. There just isn't much to do in distress land, even though it's not intuitive. I mean, you would think there should be, but the combination of free money and ability of almost everybody to access financing has suggested there's not much there. And so it's a more varied environment. I think that's also coming back to sort of how we think about things. You don't have to do everything forever. Again, I think that stress is a good example. I mean, there are some really good dedicated distressed folks who have done a very good job, have done exactly what they have said they're going to do, but there just isn't much to do. And so that would be a time where we probably would either reduce our exposure to those sets of firms or largely exit just because of the forward opportunity isn't as interesting. I think that in general, a lot of things in the alternative assets arena are, as do the underlying investments, sometimes they have more of a cyclical nature to their inclusion in portfolios or just a shorter duration of attractiveness of the opportunity set. How do you go about addressing those investments knowing that there may be that kind of cyclicality when you're also underwriting an organization, presumably, that you'd want to be around so they can take advantage of the opportunities when they're there? That's sizing for the most part. That's where you, it doesn't have to be completely either in or out. If it, part of that is having some capital hanging around the proverbial hoop, right, with the highest quality organization, that you keep an amount of capital there, but not the same as you might choose to do if you were really super excited about the robustness of the opportunity set. What are the types of characteristics on the margin from the managers that are in your portfolios compared to similar ones that aren't? We have a very, 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 I would say, strong bias to fundamentally oriented strategies across the board, as opposed to trading oriented strategies. Getting back to what's the opportunity that can be captured and what's its replicability, I would say that Over my career, I have much greater confidence in understandable, if you will, spreads or opportunities to be captured on a fundamental basis than replication of trading strategies. So that's probably one of the themes that is is across really all asset classes. So from where you sit starting the business effectively out of the buyout world and certainly near Silicon Valley, would love to hear your perspective on, let's just start with private equity these days. So as we know, that is a big term that encompasses a huge range of strategies. 
I would say that in the world of buyout growth capital, actually it's true of venture, we think the ones that are most interesting are those that are actually really doing something more than providing just capital and cheap debt and high leverage. There has to be much more of a strategic contribution. Again, that takes all different forms, but that's actually critical. We are definitely seeing valuations go up, up, up. There's been enormous beneficiaries of cheap and plentiful leverage. And I think that we continue to worry about that. But the intentionality and the caution that people feel around that is an important understanding that we have as we're making and underwriting and re-underwriting different investment opportunities. So at the beginning of your career, you were in Merger Orb, and then the opportunity set really went away, and you eventually shifted and did something else. How have you thought about that corollary in your portfolios where, let's just say that example of private equity, prices are going up and up and up, and we all know that. Whether it's private equity or somewhere else, how do you go about making a decision to make a meaningful shift in even one area that you're investing in because of that opportunity set? It really is less the big asset class opportunity set and much more a la ARB or a la distressed or a la leverage credit that it becomes much more of a sub opportunity set evaluation as opposed to an asset class operation. And that is the really hard calls because it's, as we know, it's so hard to leave or pare back when things are looking great. And one of the things that we've actually talked about a lot internally is we just have had spectacular performance coming from particularly some of the ventures, particularly some of those that have a lot in enterprise. We've seen it in the buyout lands. We've seen it, actually, we've seen it in the public portfolios. And it's really the discipline to keep trimming back as opposed to necessarily feeling these make the all the way in or all the way out call. But maintaining that discipline of trimming back is really what you have to do. Curious about the two probably most topical areas of change, crypto and ESG and DNI. But why don't we start with crypto and love to hear how you thought about it, done the research and decided to do or not decided to make investments. We have spent a ton of time over really the last five years, although predating that, trying to get smarter. And there is so much that I think that we still need to learn. A couple of my colleagues, one in particular, has Miles Danielson is really quite the expert on it and knows a ton and has really helped inform uh, the whole firm as we continue to move down the path. But I would characterize this big picture as explorers as opposed to advocates in the crypto space. We have made a couple of small commitments to some venture-oriented crypto players, really viewing that as something that could be significant, particularly in around DeFi and some of the things that we've seen where a lot of that business activity is happening in crypto land today, filled with all the attendant risks. We also have, for where it's appropriate, which again, it's a definitely a subset of our clients, small, what I would call index, quasi-index positions, Bitcoin, Ethereum positions that we basically are doing it as if an index. But this is way out on the risk reward spectrum. I view it as way out on the risk reward spectrum, but absolutely something that is interesting and something we need to continue to push ourselves to learn more and more about. And how about ESG? So I think now going back probably 10 years ago, when we were really getting the next round of investing and ESG investing was really taking hold. And there was much more discussion about impact investing and the role of impact investing and all of that. SRI 2.0 at the time, right? Which, you know, SRI was basically just filters and then we we're moving more towards the impact. We slash I sort of had a lot of frustration with the way that people were using these terms because they were using them all different ways and it meant different things to other people. So we devised, if you will, our own terminology or our own methodology that we refer to as full consequence investing. And we were really trying to do with that 
labeling or descriptor is to actually capture what people are trying to do or I think the goal, the real objective of so-called ESG investing in, which is to incorporate much more explicitly and holistically other factors into investment decision-making processes. And so when we're saying by full consequence investing, we think that if investors, regardless of sort of the asset class, are really taking into account all of the consequences of the investment, people are really thinking deeply about sustainable use of human capital, of financial capital, of physical capital in the businesses in which they're investing and how they're in, you actually will reach quote unquote, the right answer from an ESG perspective. And so we've actually been using that framework to evaluate really all the different investment people with whom we invest across asset classes. And we do definitely see a growing interest in people having much more explicit pieces of that. And we have basically group the different managers with whom we invest into having FCI factors as really central to what they're doing or more just one of the many inputs in which they're evaluating. Everybody does to a certain extent. And to the extent that people want to build portfolios that are consist of just those that have a high degree of centrality to the ESG factors in their investment discipline, we can do that. Global multi-asset class portfolios that are really, we think, have the same expected return as a more broad-based, if you will. What are the impact consequences that you see differently from how others are perceiving the ESG label? It's really changing. I do think that there are still remnants of people thinking about ESG as rooted in negative filters. None of this, no fossil fuel, no something, which again, those are perfectly legitimate things, but that I don't think captures the real power of holistic ESG investing. I actually think that if you In the world state that I see, in the end, people will really be incorporating these things fully, and it won't even be something that will be described as something else. It will just be an expected part of a person that's going to be an active investor, that it's necessary. A key piece of that, though, is time horizon. I think that energy is a good example of that. We probably stopped investing in making commitments to private energy funds now probably, I don't know, four-ish years ago. And we didn't stop because we thought they were inherently bad, but we stopped because the price deck became so much more uncertain on forward oil prices because of the substitution, because of the risk of regulation, because of the technological advances. And those things in our mind just made the risk reward of those investments just less appealing. And I think that that's a time horizon conversation that is a good example of how those different factors can be attached to investment choices. When you were looking at a manager or strategy today, where do some of those factors give you and your team the most difficult decisions and trade-offs? I think that that harks back a little bit to what we were talking about in terms of private equity today or venture in some sense. It's understanding what has been rewarded and why in sort of valuation land. Let's talk about enterprise. There's a whole sets of reasons technology has been so extraordinarily rewarded and some of the tech companies have been rewarded. And so the factors that we think about are, is there going to be a dramatically changing regulatory environment that you won't be able to capture that same kind of outsized profitability? What are the risks of new radical disruption that people think like, you know, can't happen, but it's going to happen, right? I don't know what the next cloud is, but there's going to be something that will, again, radically disrupt even the players that are so strong today. So as you look at your team and your portfolio over the years, I'm curious what you think your, maybe the right way of framing it is competitive advantages are or the things that you think your team does really, really well. A definite competitive advantage is the fact that we have a long time horizon. Our organization is filled with long tenured people. 
and that we have clients that are long tenured and our clients, our new ones also have a long time horizon. And we talked about that, but that actually is a huge advantage. And in some sense, the more we can do to kind of reinforce that in our own behaviors and as we are adding new client relationships, huge advantage. I think that another thing that we do quite well, but we absolutely need to continue to do and work at and be very conscious of is to try and be as harshly objective as we can be. And that's hard to do, particularly because we spend a lot of time getting to know the people with whom we invest and understanding that and we, it's all about building really deep conviction. And so once you have deep conviction about something, you almost necessarily are no longer as harshly objective as you need to be. And it's that continual both development of conviction around the investment decision, which in our case manifests through selection of a person to whom we'll allocate capital to, with the continual rigorous underwriting and re-underwriting of that. How does your process work to try to make that happen? I think that it's really how we go about it. In some sense, it's the culture and the the way that we actually conduct ourselves, right? I mean, that's in some sense my responsibility to continue to model that position. It's Eric Alt and Jessica Ritzau, who are the co-CIOs of the firm. They are in that role and modeling that behavior and that mindset and that investment practice. And that's really how it's reinforced. It has to be intentional. So I know through your career, you've sat on the investment committees of a number of organizations, Princeton, your alma mater, Mellon, a bunch in California. I'm curious, both the dynamic of what it's like when you're in this seat every day, sitting on the committee, and then also what you've learned from those experiences. I have sat on and chaired a number of investment committees. And I'd say that one of the things that I have both on all sides of the table, I think having a really deep and shared understanding of the role of the committee is critical. And in some cases, those have been, I've been involved in committees where there is a very active involvement in the portfolio composition. In others, it has been the hiring of an investment team who are responsible and then the role the importance of the committee is to do the essentially strategy, asset allocation, as well as continuing to oversee and engage with the people who are full-time on the investment decision-making. So I think that actually having clarity about the role of the committee and the responsibility is the most important. I'd love to know a little more about your experience, say, with Princeton in particular. Andy was a colleague of mine at Yale back in the day. What was that dynamic like sitting on the board of Princeton's endowment? I was on the board of Princo for many, many, many years and had the great joy of working with Andy. And I was chair for three years before, uh, chair of Princo before I moved on to another position with the, the larger university board. And, you know, I think that in all of those cases, what was really interesting was actually engaging in these exactly these debates that we've been talking about, about opportunity set, about the right allocation, about what's a time horizon, about what are the actual attributes that make an opportunity interesting or not, and how things are changing. That was just fun. I think that's true, actually, if I think about all the different investment committees I've been on, particularly in the places where I sit in a chair seat, it's both working closely with the CIO and talking through the different sets of issues and questions that come up, whether it be portfolio questions or shifting strategy questions or team development questions. I enjoy that. And I've learned a lot from that in every circumstance because every circumstance is different. And it's also about how to actually, one of the things I'd say that I have learned and continue to learn is how to actually involve the other committee members in a way that is both engaging and 
constructive. Typically, these investment committees have really interesting, successful investment people in their own right. And setting up conversations and discussions and the topics to actually be able to bring forth that really valuable insights, that's both fun, but also an ongoing effort. You know, it's a, something that I think that we all keep learning about how to do that most effectively. So what do you think Hall Capital looks like five or 10 years from now? I bet the Hall Capital will... We'll continue to grow. We continue to grow. We've actually grown meaningful in assets and much less so in clients. That's actually by design. In some sense, we are very much attentive to still being an extremely high touch, very close partnership with all of our clients. So as we've continued to add new clients, they generally speaking have been larger. So I think that we will continue to have meaningful growth. We'll have growth in clients, but more meaningful growth in assets. Hopefully, not just from adding clients, but from returns, the good way. We have offices here in San Francisco and New York, but we really are sort of one team. I think that that commitment that we have to being a very tight, relatively flat organization is still just such an important part of our culture and who we are. So I think we are trying to balance that in some sense, both imperative to continue to grow with maintaining a very particular culture. So when you look back over now, oh, 27 years or so of Hall Capital, what surprises you the most? A, that it's been that long of time. It doesn't feel like that at all. I mean, I look back, I'm thinking, wow, that was a long time. And of course, I look around, you know, my colleagues have grown up, they've had families and their kids are now, my kids are big. I mean, so probably the thing that's most surprising is that all that time passed and on some hand, it doesn't really feel like that at all. On the other, we've done a lot and accomplished a lot. So I think that's probably what I would say mostly. All right, Katie, I can't let you go without asking you a few closing questions. So what is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I'm a big reader. I read mostly fiction, not only, but mostly fiction, highbrow, lowbrow, sci-fi, all the above. Cool. How do you find time to read fiction when there's so much reading you need to do for your work? I spend a lot of time. Well, I did. I spent a lot of time on airplanes and, you know, at night and weekends. That's what I like to do. What's your most important daily habit? I don't know if it's the most important, but... A daily habit that actually is really important to me is I really do like to start my day by clearing my email and getting my to-do list done. That is very liberating to me to be able to feel like I can have that day start in an organized, coherent way. And I explicitly do not do that on the weekends. I ignore my work email on the weekends and try not to look at it until... Sunday night, if at all. So during the week, how do you make sure your days don't get away from you? Well, I start early. I get up. <laughs> <laughs> I get up. I do like to get in before everybody else. And so I have, you know, I could try and carve out that half hour to do my thing, which isn't to say that my days don't frequently get away from me. They do all the time. I'm like, well, okay, tomorrow's another day. Start again. What's your biggest personal pet peeve? Probably hypocrisy. It just really irritates me when people say one thing and do something else. How about on the investment side, your biggest investment pet peeve? Ugh, absolutely. When people confuse luck slash time and place with skill or innate ability. And that is rife in the business. And that is definitely one of my pet peeves. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? Probably I would say my father and Warren Hellman. My father had a long career in business, but he definitely conveyed a mode of kind of leadership that I would characterize as sort of direct, ambitious, but very much sort of grounded in a respectful form of leadership that I would say that I've tried to emulate or learn from. And Warren was just an incredible mentor, colleague, back from when I first started at 
HFS partners, again, all the way through, as I said, sort of the adventures and misadventures of Laurel Arbitrage, and then really was their day one and established the firm that we are today. What's been your biggest investment mistake? I have made so many investment mistakes. It would be hard to say what would be my biggest. I would say that one of them that harks back to my Laurel Arbitrage days is not pivoting soon enough. I mean, I talked about I was doing merger arbitrage and merger arbitrage went away and I didn't pivot into restructuring and distress, which others did at the time. I kind of held quite tightly to the literalness of what I initially said I was doing. And I'd say in general, the mistakes that I've made have been in that stubbornness versus conviction continuum and not realizing soon enough when I'm being stubborn versus when I'm acting with high conviction. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I'm from a large family. I'm one of eight. And my parents absolutely let each of us pursue whatever we're going to pursue in a different way. And we have different talents and different personalities. And my parents absolutely believe that there's a lot of ways around the bend and they all should be respected. And I think that is an absolute, that is a principle that I try to bring to my own life and my own family. All right. Last one, Katie. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Probably a big life lesson is that you can't solve other people's problems for them, even if you want to. And that you can be supportive, you can be empathetic, you can help. But in the end, people need to walk their own walk. Great. Katie, it's been an amazing ride for you and a great story. So thanks for sharing it. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. An important disclaimer from Janice Henderson Group, PLC. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principle and fluctuation of value.